men and women being tied together. So she is one of the world's greatest misogynists, of which there have been many, and are still many, around. And uh, so she put down men. Now, uh, but the women came and worshipped her up there in the Parthenon. There's the men, you might say, why? Because the concept of gods and goddesses back then is appeasement. You appease the gods. You don't love the god. You, hate, you might hate the god. In fact, many of the most famous gods are around the hated. But you have to appease the god. How do you appease the god? You come to the temple, you make your offering, and you say nice things about the god in the temple. But this idea that you love God, God loves you, this is not Greek. Uh, unless we're talking about Aphrodite, and then we're talking about sexual love. And uh, that's another whole deal, right? No, the, the idea of agape love, uh, of, of non-sexual love, of purest love, is Christian. I mean, this is, it existed among the Greeks, but it wasn't popularized. It was really popularized Christianity. Christianity is the great movement of agape love. You love not because you're going to get anything out of it. You do love because love is the thing to do. That's what you do if you're a Christian. It's just your, your obligation. And it's a revolutionary idea. So when Paul comes up down here and talks about agape love, they know what he's talking about. He uses the word agape. But he, uh, he is promoting this idea that this is the centerpiece. And they're, you know, they, they're kind of confused because you don't love God. And you don't love your fellow man particularly. Um, but what, what, you, what the Greeks were much more interested in what they call filial, which is brotherly love. So you have this relationship with other people, filial love. But uh, only mothers have agape, which the idea that only mothers are the ones that love without expecting anything in return, right? And, and that concept of love that Paul promotes takes root. And it's in the Greek world, in the Greek city-states, that Christianity flourishes, and then later, of course, Rome. Now, so the, the fundamental underlying foundation of, say, American democracy is the concept of citizenship, and that the citizens are the ones that choose the ruling. Now, think about American citizenship in the very early years. Who had the citizenship? Only white man, adults, had what? Land, money, property. Land, money, property. Voila, right? I mean, in other words, this is not in its essentially changes in terms of what democracy is. It's the expansion of the, of the citizenry uh, over first in England and in America, and then ultimately uh, to all people. So we, we still have groups that aren't totally uh, in, uh, considered fully citizens. And uh, this is uh, one of the problems of American culture, but fundamentally, We've tried to include as many people, uh, I would say, in the last uh, 200 and some years of the American experiment, uh, trying to expand who's, who can be a citizen. And uh, it's really an important concept. Now, I want to talk over here about the Temple of Dionysus. Now, Dionysus, of course, we know as the god of wine, uh, Latin name Bacchus. So, We'll see the great um, example of this in later this spring when we have the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Uh, Mardi Gras, of course, is who is the head of Mardi Gras in New Orleans? Bacchus. It's, it's, and they call it Bacchanalia because people drink and get drunk and all of this kind of thing. But that's such a misunderstanding of. Dionysus. 
Dionysus gave wine to mankind, but not to get drunk. In fact, hardly anybody in the ancient world ever got drunk. And you say, well, how do you know that? Simple. Wine is very expensive. You could get drunk, and people would do it, but they do it on purpose, and they do it so they could commune with Dionysus. But you didn't just go out and get drunk, unless you were an emperor and had you know, endless quantity of wine. But the average person, wine is medicine. Wine is what you take to make yourself feel better, to make yourself uh, get through an abscess tooth, a, a, a broken bone, bone, something like that. In other words, wine is considered medicine, a gift from the God. And it's the only thing they have. I mean, you can go to the cabinet and pick out Tylenol, right? We have so many, right? Glee, uh, Advil, I mean, you just go on and on, right? They didn't have that. What did they have? They had wine. So you're not feeling good? You got a headache? What do you do? You take wine. It's medicine. Now, that, that distinction is really, really important. And so every year, at just about the time of Easter, which means around uh, nearby March, just after March 21st, the vernal equinox, first full moon, which by the way is also Passover, and then tied to Easter. Uh, at the Temple of Dionysus, during this time, they put on plays. Now these plays, of course, were invented in the Temple of Dionysus to tell stories. And these are stories that have a religious significance. Basically, shows you what happens to you if you don't believe in the gods, but most specifically in Dionysus. And uh, some of these stories, of which we only have a relatively small number, about a dozen or so left from the thousands that were performed. But I guess they kept the, the best ones. And those famous plays, tragedies, all have to do with what happens to you if you don't believe in the gods. In other words, the fire and brimstone tales that give you the message that you need to be devoted to these gods because these gods have to be appeased. If God isn't appeased, God's going to let you have it. And if you, and particularly if you go out of way to say something bad about the gods, you're toast. You are finished. And uh, so these would be performed with men only with masks on. So if they had a character of a woman, for example, they'd have a woman's mask, but men performed the role. Now the thing about these plays, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like us going to the Christmas pageant at church on Christmas Eve, and little children get up and they act out Joseph and Mary. We all know the story by heart. We know all the words of all the stories, right? Same. They knew the stories, but they went because they loved to see it. The spectacle. I know it's going to happen. Every note this afternoon at the Boar's Head, I know what, it's going, what they're going to do before they do it, and yet, I, it's always new. It's always new, it's always fresh, and it's always exciting. The year we went to the uh, first time to the Boar's Head by accident, uh, we had been out at Crystal Cathedral, California. They had a big, spectacular show. And this show, uh, Flying Angels Everywhere, and uh, not quite as good as Preston, where they have Santa's jumping out of the ceiling. That's not that. <laughs> but you know, I went to Prestonwood once and I thought, oh, that's really very colorful, very, very exciting. But, uh, you know, I didn't need to go again, right? At uh, the Chris Cathedral, Robert Schuller, it was beautiful in its way, but technologically very advanced, but it didn't move me, it didn't do anything to me, it didn't hit me, it didn't touch me in the soul. So that's what happened when I went to Boar's Head, it touched me. And that's a very, when art can touch you, ladies and gentlemen, that is what it's supposed to do. 
but doesn't always do it, and unfortunately. So the Temple of Dionysus, every play, every musical, every drama you've seen in person or on television or in the movies, goes back to the Temple of Dionysus. Now, then we come to this little temple down here, the Asclepian. Now the Asclepian is named after Asclepius. Asclepius was the son of Apollo. Now, Apollo was the one you prayed to if you were sick until his son was born, and then Asclepius became the god of medicine. And you would go to the Asclepium if you were sick. In other words, think hospital here. Think clinic. Uh, think therapy place or sanitarium. Something like that. All right? Now, you go uh, Asclepius, and then Asclepius had two children. He had a number of children, but two children were very famous. One was named Hygieia, from which you get the word hygiene. So you see, they understood about the importance of purifying, keeping clean these places. And then the other uh, child, Panth uh, Panacea. In other words, this idea that there's a, a cure, a pill, is something you can take that's going to solve all of your problems. So this is uh, this is a place where people would go for a variety of ailments. And here was the regime, if you can imagine it. They would go in, and the first thing they'd do would be purify. In other words, the hygiene part. They'd be clean, washed. And then, when that was over, they would be taken into a cubicle. Now, this is interesting. Our word incubation. Literally means in the cubicle. So they'd be in a small room, not very big, with a little pad on the floor. And you were to lay there. And then, when you laid there, you were supposed to uh, go to sleep and have dreams. In fact, they gave you something to have dreams. What made this quite extraordinary to us is that the room would be filled up with snakes. <coughs> And so the snakes are crossing over you and around you. They're, they're not poisonous snakes, but the snake, the idea is association of snakes with medicine, with, pure, with healing. And so this, to this day, the sign of the American Medical Association is the rod of Asclepius with a snake, one like this, headed snake up here. And that is the sign. In other words, all of our medicine is derived from this. What's interesting to me is there was as much on psychological medicine as on physical medicine. Because what they did is when you woke up, then they would have a person there to write down what you said. And the idea was that the cure was in the dream. How revolutionary is that? Mr. Freud, Mr. <laughs> Jung, right? Who thought they were coming up with something new and different. And so the Asclepian then was a place where you got your problems worked out. And, uh, but in a sense, you cured yourself. And then they would send you off and uh, you would uh, hopefully return to your normal routine. But if you got sick again, then you'd come back and do it all over again. Now, that's really amazing to me. There's also something up here that was all over this area called the Stoa, S-T-O-A. What it is, it's a walkway, a covered walkway, from one building to another, from one area to another called the stoa. And people would sit in these, particularly if it was hot, you get in the shade, 
or if it was rain or even snowing, they would huddle inside here. And there were certain groups that came to the stoa. And no matter the weather, they would sit there and endure it and listen to their leader. And from which we get what word? Stoic. Stoic. So among the many Greek philosophical groups were the Stoics. And the Stoics believed that one should try to find the middle in life, not be, try to be insanely happy or insanely depressed, right? In other words, manic depressive condition to them was a bad thing. What they wanted you to do was to find the middle so that you didn't react too much you had great good news, well that's good. If you had great bad news, well that's the way it goes. You know, that kind of thing. Kind of the Garrison Keeler approach to life, <laughs> if you understand Garrison Keeler. Now, what's interesting, the Stoics, that philosophical group met here. Most of the philosophical groups did not meet here. They met in another place called the Academy. Academy. Now what was the Academy? The Academy was in, was out in the country where there were trees. You know how college campuses today are often set apart, they don't have lawns and trees and so on. Uh, that idea of the university was the idea of the philosophers that they should do their contemplation away from the hubbub. See, this is the hubbub here. This is a lot of stuff going on here. So they wanted, so they're not far away. But they're in a grove of trees, so all of the famous ones, of course, Socrates, the most famous, and Plato, Aristotle, all of them had their, had their uh, places, or had their time, I should say, in the academy. But the academy uh, wasn't so much a building, actually. Many of these uh, groups would meet outside in the woods. But it became the play, the gathering place. So if you went to Athens, you would go to the academy, and there you would study uh, the philosoph philosophical ideas of whoever, whatever man that you was there teaching you. And so that's the foundation of a university in education. I mean, that's really our first higher education. So to sum up, so many things, so many pieces of our culture are here. They start here. Now, I want to talk about uh, next week, when I talk about Alexandria, I'll take the last of the great philosophers, Aristotle, and then tie him into Alexandria. And uh, we're going to see some very interesting things come out of Alexandria, and then ultimately all of it comes together in Rome. Rome is extraordinarily important, of course, for us. Because although many of the ideas didn't come from Rome, Rome is the conduit to get to us. Because American culture you know, ultimately comes back from the Rome. So any comments or questions before we wrap this up today? Anybody want to ask anything about Athens? Uh, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, I'm understanding you right. You said Paul introduced agape love. Am I well, he, no, uh, agape was already a common idea among the Greeks. But what he did, he, they, they, they were surprised when he was talking about Christianity, this idea of a loving God. A loving God, where did that come from? See, they didn't get that. So the idea of agape, uh, <laughs> they understood what he was saying. They just couldn't believe they could put it at the center. See, that's, that's really essentially what makes Christianity, from their point of view, unique. Yes, sir. Where was the Lyceum in relation to these other places? Okay, so I'm, the Lyceum uh, is here, uh, but not uh, at this place. You know, Lyceum, the, the temple of the, of the wolf god, was Apollo. Uh, it's controversial as to where it was, or in fact, if it existed as a physical building. This has been a big argument. Now, we'll talk about the Lyceum, uh, particularly uh, next week.
and uh, and then also into Rome. They had a lyceum, but uh, whether whether they had a, a physical lyceum here is uh, not not known for sure. And I would say I think it was really more important that, to the Romans. But I explained why it was so much more important to the Romans and why they had a very prominent uh, lyceum. So we'll, we'll we'll get to that if you're able to come on that third Sunday. Yes, Chris. You mentioned concrete a, a little earlier. I don't know if that was just a way to describe stone. Yeah. Did they actually have the technology of concrete at that time? No, and uh, the, what, they, what happened, and I'll get into this the third Sunday when I talk about Rome. The Romans, of course, perfected concrete. Concrete was around in some ways, but they perfected concrete. And so what's amazing is what they built in concrete, a lot of it's still there. And that's uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, right? So, uh, but most of what they built was stone. And like, just those big, beautiful columns, yeah. all just carved out. Is all carved right? out like a pie, and then they'd stack them up and so on. But uh, ultimately, they would build in concrete and then make it look like, you know, put stone on the yeah. outside, this kind of thing. We'll talk about this, we talk about the Pantheon. But the, the thing about the Romans is they're much more important to us as engineers and as innovators than they were as philosophers. But they 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 basically built their non <coughs> philosophy. What what's stunning, this whole period isn't much more than fifty years. The golden age of Athens, they only produced the great philosophers and the great writers and the great tragedies, all of this in just a short little period of time. That was all basically lost once they lost the uh, Peloponnesian War to Sparta. And they never never achieved anywhere near the, the prestige. Of, uh, they, they were so important. And by the way, the academy carried on for a long time. Uh, but Christianity couldn't have this. So this became a church for a long time. So they, they didn't allow uh, the pagan religion to go on. Yeah. Uh, so what year was this, this 50-year time period so in history? So it's um, uh, 40, just say round about 450 to 400. I mean, just okay. Gonna, so is that, that before or after Alexander? So Alexander is, that is three, he hits uh, Egypt, uh, about three to two, so mm -hmm. about a hundred mm -hmm. years later. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I was just there this last summer. Yeah. And uh, there was an area. It might have been the Stoa, but it was a city where they put all the pots together. Oh yeah. And then right behind that was kind of the entryway that went up through to the city where all the cemeteries were at. Ah, yes. And it was very clear to me that the concept of an afterlife mm -hmm. was very important there and bled over a little bit in the Christianity. Absolutely, yeah. The Did stellas it? that they had mm -hmm. there uh, were very great arts of work. Mm -hmm. They always showed the dying person sitting down, saying goodbye to mm -hmm. the people around them, and mm -hmm. looking at those who would tell a story about that person. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, of course, but it's always been a question of whether Christianity influences the pagan religions or the pagan religions influence Christianity more. That, that what, what really happens, in my opinion, is a blending of the, found, the great theological foundations of, of Christianity, St. Augustine, in the beginning. It's all built on Plato, all of it. And, uh, and then Aristotle, and, but mostly Plato. And so, Western civilization comes out of all this, but again, the conduit is the Roman Catholic Church. So, uh, that, this is a, a good point you're making about, there's a lot of stuff going on besides what I'm talking about here. This was the center of their world. The city is all around it. And they are very uh, uh, hardworking, very ingenious people. But um, they're also very tied to their religious <coughs> and so religion is very very important to them and uh, 
many of those religious ideas then carry over into Christianity, in, into the uh, orthodox form of Christianity. Well, we'll uh, continue this then, I hope, with many of you next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.